Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Months of reviewing and analyzing the subclasses in Tasha's brings us to our final subclass, The Path of the Wild Magic Barbarian. If you want to check out any of the other subclasses in Tasha's, I've analyzed them all, and there is a playlist linked to the video description. I would like to thank the patrons of this channel which support the creation of these videos. If you have interest in supporting this content, please consider checking out my Patreon page which is linked in the video description. Patrons of this channel receive benefits like ad-free early release access to these videos, and my top-level patrons can join me for some D&D on a monthly basis. So let's get started. Barbarians and magic generally are not bedfellows since rage prevents the casting or concentration on spells. If you really want to have magic and you decide to go straight class barbarian anyway, then uh, I guess Path of Wild Magic is your choice. Thematically, the Path of the Wild Magic Barbarian has been transformed from the magical influences of a realm of supernatural power, maybe the Feywild, maybe the Upper Plains, whatever that means. So when they rage, they can also manifest some magical power. They also become more sensitive to magic, sensing the powerful effects that non-barbarians are able to accomplish. So, let's go through what this subclass receives. At third level, we're going to get two features. The first of them is Magic Awareness. This allows us to know the location of any spell or magic item within 60 feet that's not behind total cover using an action. This lasts until the end of our next turn, and it can be done a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus per long rest. I could see this coming in handy occasionally. A spellcaster may be able to do this with a detect magic ritual, but that's a 10 minute ritual, and you don't always have that right away. On occasion, a quick way to check for potential magic items before moving on might be useful. I think, however, we need to keep in mind that in a lot of cases, this is simply another way for a party to accomplish what they already probably could accomplish with the ritual that isn't limited in uses. The other feature at third level, and the far more dramatic one, is Wild Surge. This is the feature that largely defines this subclass. Whenever we enter a rage, we roll a d8 to randomly determine a magical effect that accompanies our rage. Unlike the Wild Magic Sorcerer table, there's nothing bad that can really happen here. In fact, everything here is almost, without exception, objectively a benefit. Though in some cases, those benefits are circumstantial, so I wouldn't count on the benefit actually affecting the combat it manifests in. And I say almost without exception, because there are very rare, admittedly, circumstances that could actually make you less effective. And I'll get into that more. Until very high level, there isn't a way to influence this result. So these options really are completely random. So let's go through what might happen. The first is shadowy tendrils appear when you rage, and each creature of your choice within 30 feet makes a constitution save or takes a d12 necrotic damage, while at the same time you get a d12 temporary hit points. The second is you can teleport to a space up to 30 feet away that you can see, and you can do so again on each of your turns as a bonus action. The third is you summon an intangible spirit within 5 feet of a creature of your choice, preferably an enemy, that you can see within 30 feet of you. At the end of your turn, it explodes, and creatures within 5 feet of it get a dexterity save, or they take a whole 1d6 force damage. You can do so again as a bonus action on each of your following turns. The fourth is a weapon you are holding is infused with magic, and it has its damage type switched to force, and it gains the light and throw on properties. Your weapon is also effectively a returning weapon if you throw it and your range is 20 feet for short range, 60 feet maximum range. The fifth is whenever a creature hits you with an attack roll, they take a d6 force damage as long as your rage is going. The sixth is you gain a plus one bonus to your armor class, and allies within 10 feet of you get the same bonus while you're raging. The seventh is that you have a 15 foot extension of difficult terrain around you that impacts only your enemies. And the eighth and final one is that you choose a creature you can see within 30 feet of you, they have to make a constitution save or take a d6 radiant damage, and they're blinded until your next turn. 
You can use the effect again as bonus action on each of your turns while you are raging. So this is the primary ability of this subclass, and I do not like it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I could see any of these options being extremely useful in the right circumstances. Well, maybe except for the D6 Exploding Spirit, which is pretty lousy, I think. However, with no idea which of these is going to come up, you really have to get lucky for something useful to appear. And if you're unlucky, it could even potentially be really bad. And I'm sorry, but a 1 in 8 chance of my weapon becoming light is of no use to me. I've already built my character around not having a light weapon. But changing my held weapon to force damage could actually be devastating if I'm fighting one of the few creatures that are immune to force damage. And they are few and far between indeed, but they do exist. And it could be inconvenient if I had something like the Crusher Feet that's suddenly rendered unavailable to me. Some combats would be aided tremendously by the ability to teleport, but there's only a 1 in 8 chance that's what I'm going to end up with. And there's a far better chance that when it does come up, it's not going to be doing that much, or maybe not any good at all. And 3 out of 8 of these are going to require bonus action to take advantage of, so keep your bonus action available. Or maybe not, since 5 out of 8 of them don't use your bonus action after your initial rage. Essentially, my issue is that any of these abilities might be good, but our ability to plan and take advantage of them, or be able to access them when we need them, is non-existent. So when one of these abilities might be useful to us, we have a 1 in 8 chance in any combat. But I think there's a very good chance you'll access something that will either be of little or no use to you, even though that ability might have been very good in some other situation. For me, I'm going to find that frustrating, though this might be based on my style of play and character building, where I like to have tactical options at my beck and call, and I know what they are. In this case, maybe we'll have tactical advantage, maybe we won't. Roll a d8. I can see some players are going to love this. And if you are one of those players, so be it. I'm not casting shade. I'm just giving my own personal opinion here. For me, this is not my cup of tea. Then at 6th level, we get Bolstering Magic. This is one of those proficiency bonus number of times long rest abilities. You use an action and touch a creature, which can be yourself, and you get one of two benefits that you can pass along. And in this case, you do get to choose. The first is, for 10 minutes, the ally can roll a d3 whenever they make an attack or ability check and add the number to the roll. This is actually a decent benefit, though I immediately conceptually disapprove of an ability that uses a d3. I mean, would it have been that big a deal if we had made it a d4? The second ability also gets to use the d3. The creature regains an expended spell slot equal or lower to the result of the roll. You can only provide this benefit once to any single spellcaster until your next long rest. Now, if you're playing with our normal set of dice, to roll a d3, you roll a d6 and divide the number by 2, rounding up. But if you are a weirdo, you may actually own these abominations. Now, mechanically, this is a decent ability. The first feature is going to turn failures into successes and misses into hits. You could also potentially throw this on multiple creatures at once, again including yourself. Now, a d3 doesn't sound like much, but it's basically like a plus 2 bonus to all ability checks and attack rolls. So that is not bad, and the 10 minute duration means it might impact multiple combats as well. The second feature is mechanically also pretty good, though it's almost ironic that the so-called magic barbarian isn't casting spells, they're just having spellcasters be even better. Still, at 6th level, that's like 3 second level spells on average, so that's not bad. So I like the 6th level ability way more than the 3rd level ability for sure, even with the unholy D3s. At 10th level, we get unstable backlash. When you fail a saving throw or when you take damage, you can use your reaction to roll on the wild magic table. And that's your wild magic table, not the wild magic sorcerer's table. And immediately apply the result, which replaces your current wild magic result. I mean, assuming you roll a different result. 
This one is maybe the worst ability this subclass gets. This isn't free, you need to use your reaction, and you roll a d8, which the odds are is not going to help you. I mean, maybe. If I get the teleport, and I needed the teleport, then great. But if I needed the teleport and I get the force weapon, or difficult terrain, or the mildly explosive spirit, then I've wasted my reaction for nothing, or nearly nothing. Though again, this is kind of the theme of the subclass. Here's a feature which lets you roll a d8, and maybe something useful will happen. Personally, I loathe that. Finally, we get Controlled Surge at level 14. This allows us to roll twice on the table and choose the result. And if we get the same result twice, we can choose any result. I would be big on this ability if it came earlier, but 14th level seems really late to get our first ability that impacts our random result. Now, a Wild Magic Sorcerer has to wait for the same level for a similar benefit. But this just seems like so much later for some reason. Maybe it's because I'm much less likely to take a Barbarian to level 14. Though honestly, I think it's because of the way in which the Wild Magic portion of these two subclasses are presented. If you are playing a Wild Magic Sorcerer, their features right from first level are giving them advantage on checks, adding or subtracting d4s to the checks of others, and then the Wild Magic is kind of a side effect almost. In the case of the Path of Wild Magic, the Wild Magic is the feature, so it's either of benefit to you or you get nothing. And that's not to say I think the Wild Magic Sorcerer is a great subclass, but there is more that would draw me to that than to this. So the path of Wild Magic Barbarian is one that I would put at or near the bottom of the pack for Barbarians. Then again, is it worse than the Battle Rager or the Berserker or the Storm Herald? Uh, maybe not but I definitely wouldn't say it's much better than those either. So we finish up our Tasha subclasses with a bit of a whimper. But again, I know there are a number of players who really like the thematics of a random roll, and maybe something good happens and maybe it doesn't, and for those players, they may find this subclass a lot of fun, even if it's mechanically not all that great. So if you're one of those players, this might be for you. And again, no judgments at all. We enjoy different things. Personally, I will definitely pass on the Path of Wild Magic. So I hope you found this video and this series useful. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. Until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you again soon.